Same with Ryan Forrester. Ryan Forrester. Um, so what would you call yourself? A you're an adventurer, right? Or you're a you're an author. You've you've done how many books have you done now? Over 37, right? 37. 37. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're a scientist, you um you're a mm-hmm. tour you you lead tours, so you're an adventurer. Right. Basically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I guess that must have, 2020 must've put a, a kink in your, your tour touring for groups, I guess. But I, is that... a, a, a stake, I think a stake in the heart is, is more of a way to describe it. Yeah. I imagine. Are you starting back up in 2021? Cause I saw a couple of uh, Peru trips scheduled on your website. Yeah, we have one for June, one for August, and one for November, and then also a tour of Egypt in October. So hopefully all of this will have passed by then. That's that's what we're hoping and praying for. Yeah, I hope so too. I'm I'm sick of it. <laughs> I'm I'm ready to get out there. So uh yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, so um so y- you currently live in South America, am I correct? I live in Peru. You live in Peru, okay. And Am I am I correct in understanding that you actually own mm-hmm. this the Paracas Skull Museum? No, that's um, that's owned by my mentor who died a couple of years ago. Okay, so you just kind of uh, but but you you have like a lot of involvement in it, right? Uh, I have done it in the past, but of course with this current situation, the museum has been closed for almost a year. So you know we're hoping all of this stuff is going to start opening up as time goes on. That's what we're working on as much as possible. Like I, I noticed you post a lot on YouTube. So are you basically just posting like um, more clips from some of the stuff that you have done in the past? Like, you know, um, uh, like a lot, like for instance, yesterday I watched one that you did of Palenque mm-hmm. in Mexico, or was that, is that more recent or is that like your, these are all um, footage from past tours? Um, oh yeah. It's all, you know, it's all from hard drives because we, we can't go any, you know, we can't go anywhere. Um in fact, we're going back into lockdown in two days. So leaving the house is going to be difficult for at least two weeks. So there's, you know, there's no way. I was in Mexico in April and May and uh, did some a bit of filming there, but all the ar- archaeological sites were closed. So, um, yeah, it's it's been very tough, but uh, looking forward to the, the future. Yeah, me too. Okay, so like, let's talk about um, let's talk about the Paracas skulls real quick. So, how many are it, are in existence that you know we have that the, that the public has access to? Well, the the public has has access to um, a limited number in different museums, a few in the main Lima Museum, uh, our little museum here, another museum in the city of Ica. They're also found in museum collections around the world because they're so bizarre looking that, you know, the British Museum has them, Smithsonian has them, uh, Philadelphia Museum has them, uh, German museums have them. There are hundreds, if not thousands, in museum collections. And are they all from Peru, this this area? Or Because I know that you've talked about how there's a genetic connection with the Black Sea. Like... Mm-hmm. And is there actually the same elongated skulls found ar- around that area? Yeah, they look exactly the same. Okay, so th- I, I, I've seen, I've actually seen some in the Lima Museum, uh, and I they look bigger than regular human heads. I mean, they are bigger than regular human heads. So, I mean, were these people like maybe not eighteen foot giants, but they were they bigger than regular? people? I mean, uh, well, they, they were taller than native Peruvians. Native Peruvians tend to be about five foot four and the Paracas were about six feet. So they were, you know, bigger than what the average native person would look like. Well, th- is there any skeletal remains that are ever found with, with the skulls that we have access to? Oh, hundreds of, uh, not that we have access to. Uh, there are hundreds of, of mummy bundles in the Lima Museum, but they don't put them on display. Um, there are a few in smaller museums around me that I've had access to. 
And what about this? Uh, I've heard you talk about this, this, the star child uh, skull. What's the current story with that? Well, it's a very odd looking little skull that uh, looks very similar to the star child skull that Lloyd Pye was famous for. Um, you know, it has eye sockets that angle up like that. Um, it doesn't, didn't have any teeth. We weren't able to find the lower jaw, which is problematic, but um, any medical doctor who's looked at it, and I've had many medical doctors look at it, they simply said, I don't know what that is, you know, if, if they're being honest, which um, all of the ones that I've shown them this stuff to, they just go, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and then, um, okay, so, so you have had um, DNA sampling on some of these skulls, and uh, they're is it is it am i correct in um thinking that you've concluded that some of it isn't exactly what when you, when i when i've heard that it's maybe not homo sapien sapien does that mean that it's it's completely foreign or does that mean that it could have like denisovan or neanderthal or like the hobbit people or you know, like some other kind of like relative of a of a homo sapien sapien uh it doesn't look like it um i think they're homo sapien paracas so there were subspecies that um, originally existed around the Black Sea, must have migrated to the coast of Peru, and then were basically wiped out by the Nazca culture around 2,000 years ago. Okay, so do you think with the Nazca culture, with the Nazca lines, do you, um, do you think that the the Paracas, do, do you think that they had anything to do with the Nazca lines, or is that completely two different cultures? Um, yeah, the Paracas started that whole system. So they built a, a large uh, geoglyph here, about 10 miles from where I'm at, called the Candelabro, which is about 500 feet tall on the side of a mountain. And then they moved south towards them. They did hundred, like 1,500 geoglyphs on tops of little Mesa mountains. Um, and then they were, as I said, they were wiped out by the Nazca. And then the Nazca continued on with the the practice of the lines, the geoliths. Hmm. Yeah, I've I, I've been to I've been to um, uh, Peru, and I remember seeing that. It, I I thought it looked like a menorah, almost, you know, like a. Uh, but it, it, yeah, it was, it was super cool. So you so you must live close to the little island with all the penguins and stuff on it. That's close to that camp. Oh yeah, I can actually see it from. If I walk walk it on the deck, I can see right out there. Oh, awesome. That's a very, very beautiful area. That's very cool. Do you think that they had, that this same culture had anything to do with like the building of Cusco or Saxe Woman or like Machu Picchu, like any, any of the, uh, that area as well, or? No. No. Okay. So that's complete. So the, like, that was a complete, that was a completely different. For me, Saxe Woman was one of the I was like, what is this? It was like the stone masonry was just like the coolest thing I've ever seen anywhere in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. I just cannot fathom how it was made because it does kind of look melted in a lot of ways or not melted, but like, like put together, like Play-Doh would be put together, you know, it's like so perfect, but in like they had shapes of a serpent within like a big stone wall and stuff. So who, who do you think built that? Mm -hmm. And when do you think? Well, that that nobody was really knows. There are, well, I think, I think the megalithic stuff is at least uh, 13,000 years old. So it was all inherited by the Inca. The Inca moved into an abandoned megalithic city and that they called it Cusco because they called it the navel of the world. So nobody knows who, who did the original construction. The archaeologists keep insisting that the Inca did it, which is in, technically impossible because you've been there and you've seen it. And I've had a number of stonemasons and engineers come with me and they all say, I have no idea how anybody would do that. So that's the, that's the basic story. It's, it's unknown. Uh, the name Peru comes from an ancient uh, race of people called the Pirwas. So that's where Peru gets its name from. So it's possible they were the ancient builders or you can even get more exotic uh, thinking, you know, beyond that, if you want, as in people not of this earth. We just, we simply don't know. Yeah. The global cataclysm. You think a lot of this was pre-existing. What about, what about like, like, yeah, I think it's all like, pre-cataclysmic. 
Okay, what about um, what about like Pumapuku or you know, Tiwanaku? Same. 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 Yeah, and Same. I recently, um, yeah. I recently was uh, watching a video about um, how those H blocks, like in Pumapuku, are like have magnetic no- anomalies, and that how they can do like um, they can make things have like monopoles and stuff. So I, I don't know. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I'm the one who discovered that. <laughs> Okay, cool. So can you talk about that? Like, that's amazing. Well, it is. There are two types of stone, Pumapuku and Tiwanaku. They're actually the same place. They do, archaeologists label differently. I don't know why. But they are the same place. Whoever built the one built the other. And um, so there are two types of stone. There's red sandstone, uh, which comes from eight miles away. And then there's this gray andesite that comes from 55 miles away. And uh, the, the quarries are, are known by geologists. So the red sandstone is neutral to a compass or to a magnetometer. It shows absolutely no effect if you put a magnetometer or compass up to it. Mm. But the gray andesite reacts sometimes quite violently to either of those measuring instruments. Um, we haven't been able to find a particular pattern of magnetism yet. But uh, when you, when you, for example, with the H blocks, when you take the compass and put it the, into the central slot, the um, needle will spin by 270 degrees. And then when you pull it back out, it goes back to normal again. So no one's been able to solve um, what the relationship or why uh, those stones are magnetized. Uh, it clearly is the case. Wow. Okay. And then I've also heard you kind of talk about how they're not uniform, that like each H block is, is not necessarily exactly uniform to the next one. Is that correct? That's correct. Each one is unique. It kind of reminds me of, um, have you, uh, I went to Costa Rica and they have these, those big spheres, like the big stone spheres that are just randomly placed throughout the country. And like, I went to this one park and there was probably like Mm-hmm. 13 of them or something and they're all different kind of stone like one was made out of you could actually see little fossils in it it was like a you know like a limestone with all kinds of little stuff and then the and then there were some that were like actual granite they're they're not too far from each other they're all different shapes like some are a lot, lot larger than the other ones but they're also made out of different stones but they're next to each other and they're perfect spheres so it's very it's very bizarre i wonder um if there's any mm-hmm. kind of a construction relation. It is. Um, well, some of the theories are that the well, archaeologists, you know, with the stone spheres, archaeologists, they always have to come up with a theory about everything or a story about everything. But they don't know what those stone spheres were made. You know, who made them, why they were made, how they were made. It's the same thing with the megalithic structures. They have they have to cover their tracks no matter what but they often will come up with some kind of nonsensical story that makes no logical sense whatsoever to fit what they're looking at uh, within their paradigm. And luckily that's now falling apart. Yeah. It, it's weird to me that they can't just say, I don't know. We don't know. You know, that's like not yeah. hard. <laughs> so what about, um, have you done any, uh, what, what, what's your, what's your take on the Easter Island stones? Yeah. Um, I, again, two different cultures. Uh, the, the ones that have the European looking noses that are the big ones, they look like, you know, they were clearly made long before the smaller ones. So you have some that are 30 feet tall and then a lot of them that are about six feet tall. So the little ones were made by the Polynesians who showed up on Easter Island around a thousand years ago, and they discovered the giant ones when they arrived. You know, it's it's obvious when you go there. You just look at the difference. And uh, so, Dr. Robert Schock, who's a geologist, went there with me, and he said, "I have no problem in dating these big ones at twelve thousand plus years old, based on erosion patterns." So there's a you know there's a geologist back. And are up the, the are idea. the big ones the ones that um are like actually have the the full bodies that were buried? Yeah, all of them do. There are 950 of them. I I recently saw a video about um they were moving one of the he- one of the bodies like they like had a bunch of pulleys of of ropes and and they were it was they were able to 
make it move itself or not move itself, but with, with pulleys, they were able to make it walk basically, which, um, when I was in college, what was told to me was, um, they basically destroyed their Island by cutting down all the trees and using the logs to roll the, the, the stones on. And that's why when the, when they were discovered in the, whatever, like 1500s, they were all cannibals and, you know, did like, very few of them were existence anymore because they destroyed their own environment. Like that's the story I was told about Easter Island in college. <laughs> yeah. That's completely wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It isn't, it, it wasn't like that at all. Nobody would be stupid enough to cut down all the trees on your Island. Um, <laughs> what happened was the Poly, when the Polynesians arrived, they, they brought rats with them accidentally because rats were hiding on their canoes. So the, when the rats got out, they went right after the trees because they're quite soft palm trees. And they want, they wound up just killing almost all the palm trees off that way. Um, and then with the first, with the arrival of the first Europeans, which was Rogovine in 1720-something, he said that uh, he met with the very happy-looking people, quite a big population. They were, some were tall, some were short. Some were dark skinned, some were light skinned, some had black hair, some had red hair, and some had blonde hair. So in contact with the Europeans that caused their demise. And then 50 years later, when Captain Cook showed up, that's when they were living in caves and they were afraid to, to come out and they were starving and all that kind of thing. So it's a completely different story. Wow. Yeah. That's that's cool. Okay, so um I went to Egypt for the first time in October and I, uh, and I've since watched a bunch of your videos when I came back. And so what, what like one of the things that for me was super interesting, fascinating that I heard you say was some, I heard you talk on another podcast about how the Seraphim and about how you had somebody tell you a story about how there was, they at some point found or some, maybe it wasn't at the Seraphim, but there was some kind of, um, uh, there was a story about these electrified bodies that were fi- found and like they were maybe being used to be regenerized or like as a teleportation or something. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it turns out that story was a lie. Oh. <laughs> my informant, my informant had lied to me. I, I learned that about a month ago that he, because he was going to be with us on our, uh, on all of our coming up tours and the, the tour coordinator in Egypt told me he li- he lies to everybody because he wants them to be fascinated with stories. So I just said, well, that's the end of that relationship. Bye. Right. right. Well, the Osiren uh, to me looked very similar to, uh, you know, like a or uh, how do you say that? I mean, it's um, like the bit, I thought that Osiren, like, like when you go down and I thought it looked completely out of place for everywhere else in Egypt. I thought it was like one of the coolest places ever. So what's your take on that? Well, again, it's, it's pre-cataclysmic. The same story in Egypt. You have the, um, the dynastic work that was done by the pharaohs. And then you have the pre-dynastic work that they discovered when they entered Egypt about 5,000 years ago. So the difference between... Uh, dynastic people were able to shape uh, works in limestone and sandstone and the pre-dynastic uh, builders were working with granite and diorite and basalt, very hard stone. Mm-hmm. So again, it's the same story in different parts of the world. You have uh, the standard story, which conveniently fits in with the, with the paradigm. And then you have the, um, inconvenient story where clearly there was advanced civilization that uh, pre-exist history as we know it. I mean, what do you think about like the hinges, like um, Sainsbury or Stonehenge or, you know, some of the Carnes in France? Um, do you think that's more modern? Like they say it's like 3000 years old, or do you think that's more megalithic, like pre catechism? No, I think it's megalithic, but it's, it's not that well done. So you know, constructing Stonehenge would have been difficult because you're moving big stone blocks from a quarry maybe a hundred miles away. So that would be very difficult. But we don't see the 
precision surfaces that we see in places like Peru and Egypt and Bolivia. Um, so, yeah, I think I think the Celts or their ancestors were responsible for Stonehenge or Karnak in France, and you know all all of those kind of work, the dolmens and things like that. Uh, well, what what about so, yeah, um, I, you know Malta? Like what's your like Malta or Sardinia? I'm hoping to go to Malta in September, and Malta looks like has ancient megalithic stuff, so like the hypogeum. Um, so I'm I'm really fascinated to go there. Um, yeah, it's one of the one of the last of stuff that's really on my so-called bucket list to go. Uh, aside from going to you know, going back to places like Egypt at least once a year, but Malta looks very curious. Yeah, I'm I'm actually going um, uh, September 30th. I was supposed to go last year and that got canceled. I'm going with Maria Wheatley. Um, oh, and, good. Yeah, and so like uh, our, our, it got rescheduled for basically October 1st through the 14th or something of, of 2021. Like, fingers crossed. Like, <laughs> I really hope. Um, I um, know. <laughs> so I get, I've also never seen it, but I'm kind of like super curious about it. So like, um, when you went to, uh, okay, there's another story that I heard you talk about with, um, I don't know if it was like, if like, it was a little creature in this jar that you looked at and somebody found it in Mexico and they had put it in formaldehyde. Yeah, that's fake. That's fake. That was fake too. <laughs> Man, that's, that's not yeah, because. Well, it's too bad, but what happened was that uh, the main researcher, Eli Marzulli, is, um, who I know, he went down there and they had to make multiple trips down to, to see it. But eventually he, they were allowed to take it out of the jar to examine it. And then it automatically started to fall apart. And they noticed sections of matchsticks were used to hook the different body parts together. Uh. So that, you know, that, thing, that story just blew apart automatically. Yeah. Very clever job, but unfortunately fake. I also heard you say, like, what's more impressive than Gobekli mm -hmm. Tepli was the um, the Titus Tunnel. Yeah. What's your What's your current feeling or a hypothesis about, like, like, how advanced were? Are we talking about, like, was this Atlantis and Mu that was just destroyed and then we're just seeing the remnants of it? Or... Um, or, or what, like, what do you think, what do you think it was? Do you think they were all interconnected somehow? I don't, I think, uh, it was either what we call Atlantis or it was aliens. The more I, the more I look at this stuff, the more I see how incredibly difficult it would have been. Some of this stuff is beyond our capability. Uh, and that's what's, you know, that's what stonemasons, uh, and engineers say too. They just go. We can't do this kind of stuff. Like the boxes in the Serapium are another example, weighing a hundred tons, each one made out of the lid and the box being made out of one piece of stone. We don't have the technology to be able to do out of one piece of stone. So um, I'm, honestly, I'm, I'm steering more and more towards, yeah, at per, yeah, seamless, seamlessly fitting together. Mm -hmm. So. I'm, I'm starting to lean more and more towards the extraterrestrial uh, visitation idea uh, than, than a human civilization. So if, okay, if you go down that road, are you kind of going more with maybe the Zachariah Sitchin stuff where it's, um, you know, like maybe we are Martians or something or, or and do you then think that um, perhaps if this, these advanced beings came here and built all this. And then what do you think we are just like, um, uh, somehow related to them or how, how do you think the art, the human story fits in with that? Well, I think they simply came, they did these constructions for their own reasons and then they left. And that's why when people say, where are the tools, they took the tools with them. Um, you know, they had, they had something they wanted to do here they accomplished what they were doing. Uh, I think they were all hit by a massive series of cataclysms. And then either they were wiped out or they were able to leave before they were wiped out. And we were able to inherit 
these incredible accomplishments and then repurpose them. So the Dynastic Egyptians turned everything into a, a temple or you know something of that nature of spirituals and turned them also into uh, places of worship and reverence. But who, yeah, who the original builders were, I don't know. I don't think whoever built the stuff in Egypt was the same who did the construction in Peru and Bolivia. I think you're looking at probably three or four different civilizations being involved. Uh, maybe contemporary with one another, but maybe not. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, and there are a lot of, like, I haven't been there, but the place in Sri Lanka, what's it called? It's like Sir, um, Suragi or Syringa. I can't say it, but it's basically, it, it was, it's on a cliff and it's just like some ruins that are, you could have only gotten to them if you were able to fly. And same sort of thing with what are the Nazca lines? Like if you can only see, Mm -hmm. like what are the i mean i've seen the candelabra but i haven't actually been in a plane looking over the nazca lines but from my understanding on the ground they don't look like anything um actually as you're driving by you can see them the lines you see them come and go like that some of them Mm -hmm. but they're you know nazca covers an area of about more than 100 miles um and more than 1,600 of these geoglyphs. Some are quite, most are quite small, some are huge. The biggest ones were made by the, uh, the Nazca people, but the majority were made by the Paracas people before them. How can you tell, like, which is which? By the style, very different style. And so what's, like, why doesn't it rain there? Like that's, I guess that's presumably the reason why these lines can even still exist in the way they do, right? Is because it just, hasn't rained but hardly anything in like a thousand years or something well it rains about half an inch a year so like where i am also in paracas it rains half an inch a year that's it so you don't get rainfall um it's part of what's called the atacama desert that extends down into chile and there are places in chile where it hasn't rained for something like 300 years so it's the lack. it's mainly the lack of rainfall the lack of high winds that has allowed these things to survive for as long as they have. What's your next book going to be about? Like what's the next mystery that you're, you're thinking about? Um, Maybe my last book will be going to Israel. Like what in particular about Israel, like the dome of the rock or the like, what, what is the dome of the rock built on is, is the big question because again, there, there are megalithic aspects to the construction of what is underneath uh, Temple Mount, mm-hmm. and even Temple Mount itself, the Wailing Wall. You look at the size of the blocks, and this, there's also a tunnel that goes um, under under the Wailing Wall area. That, uh, some stones weigh 560 tons, and again, the archaeologists are saying, well, obviously Solomon was a great builder because he was able to maneuver these things up 30 feet, you know, from the ground and stick into a wall. You know, it just again, it's just ridiculous. So. I want to go there and have a look at, at what what mysteries hide in um, in Israel and see how far back in time that goes. I think again, I'll be looking at some megalithic stuff that uh, standard academics cannot explain. I just have a hard time understanding like why they aren't uh, curious about the mystery of all this stuff. Like why they just they they just ignore it rather than look at it. I guess I mean we aren't. Uh, yeah, I don't know what we can really do about that, but um, it is interesting that they, that's, I, I wonder like where that comes from, the, the um, I don't know if you call it the ability, like the desire to just overlook these major things in your face, like, like Baalbek, like the, the Lebanon or, you know, or the, the Temple of Jupiter, like the big giant, those are like the biggest blocks ever, like they're just, mm-hmm. no one really talks about it. It's just like, yeah, they built a temple on top of it, you know? Yeah. But it's like, yeah. okay, but we have to. But well, the no. important thing is to simply, yeah. The important thing is simply to make videos and podcasts and stuff and, and teach the world that that is the story. Um, and that's that's the best way to move forward with it because it's, it's just becoming more and more ridiculous uh, them trying to, protect their paradigm when obviously they know it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. 
So uh, that's, you know, that's the way forward is not to debate or anything, just present the evidence and let people see what is in front of their faces, you know, what their eyes are looking at, like, oh, I don't understand. It's like, good, neither do I. <laughs> So anytime you've you've had your tours where you've had people that you've you've taken around, um, have you ever had like really big naysayers that are like, for instance, that sexy woman going like, yeah, oh, yeah, anybody could have done this. Like, do you actually have naysayers when you show them the evidence? Never. Not yeah. one person in thousands have said, oh, I I I get how I could do I get how somebody could do that. They all just look at it at this stuff just completely dumbfounded and go, what, you know, we don't have this back in Missouri. It's like, that's correct, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I am. Um... Uh, yeah, people are just, yeah, everyone's, yeah, their, their jaws just drop and go, what? For me, actually, like I, 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 I had just barely started studying ancient archaeology stuff whenever I went to Peru. And I actually went with a yoga tour guide. I, I, it wasn't, or a yoga group. It wasn't specifically for, you know, ruins and stuff. And I, I, I like couldn't sleep at night. Like I would, when I, like for me, I mean, I did, I, I did, uh, I did Machu Picchu and we did a, a, a lot of these things, but I, when I went to sexy woman, like all I was just like, I like, I couldn't sleep for like three nights. Cause I was just like, what is this? Like, this is like, this is not okay. Like, why aren't we all talking about this? This is crazy. Like when I saw it in person and I had never even mm-hmm. heard the name before, before I went there, I had never, that, that had never even been something that like w- was in my radar. And I was like, why, why isn't this something that every kindergartner knows about? It's just, it's just, um, mm-hmm. I, I, I do find that when people actually go and see some of these things for themselves in person, their paradigms will really, really, really be shifted. Oh yeah. How many, how many tours do you try to do in Peru a year? Uh, we've reduced it down to about three, three main, main ones and then some private ones, but, um, yeah, we'll just have to see what, uh, what the future holds down there. Are you able to study stuff locally oh yeah 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 the elongated skull graveyard is about a 20 minute drive from my house so i've got all that in this area very very cool well brian it was really fun i had i had a really good time talking Mm -hmm. to you thank you so much for doing this and i love your uh youtube channel so please keep posting stuff i think it's it's um you have such amazing insights and you really are a treasure to us all so thank you okay well, thank you. Please share the please share my YouTube channel with people. It'd be good to have more and more people look at look at the evidence.